Theater presents Anne Blythe and Raymond Burr. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents The Redhead, starring Raymond Burr. And now, here is your hostess, Anne Blythe. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, The Redhead, starring Raymond Burr as Andy. Marie Johnson's gone away from our town. She's gone away and there are many who will mourn her. And some while mourning others who were close to them will wonder what happened to that pleasant nurse who worked so hard and did so much when things were going their worst. You see, we had an epidemic in our town. And Marie, well, that's a chance that nurses take. There are many who will wonder. The newsboy who works the corner of 14th and Colfax, he'll look for the familiar sight of her coming down 14th in her white Lyle stockings and blue cape with that shock of bright red hair framing the smile she always gave him. And the cashier at Schroeder's cafeteria. She'll look along the service line for her and probably resent it a little whenever someone else uses the corner table Marie had used so often. There'll be an extra copy of the Saturday Evening Post at Walgreens Drugstore from now on and an empty seat on the 815 Colfax Avenue car. The conductor, Mr. Meehan, will wonder about her when he makes his stop at William Street and perhaps he'll let the light change twice before he goes ahead, thinking that at any moment she might run down the steps of that big gray apartment building and be grateful that he waited. And then perhaps after a few days he'll think she's moved away, gone to live with her parents or something, and in a way he'll be right. She's moved away all right, but she left so much behind her in our town. If you want to know how much, ask this man. There are a lot of things he is right now but would not be except for her. I'm coming. Oh, Dr. Johnson. Good morning, Mrs. Halter. I was so sorry to hear about your sister. What happened to her, I mean, was such a shock to all of us. Thank you, I... I just stopped by to see about her things and make some arrangements. Of course. Now, you just wait a moment. I'll get the key to her flat. We don't want you hurrying anything on our account. Oh, where is it now? Hear me. Oh, he here it is. Your sister was such a lovely girl. Uh, follow me. I was thinking if you'd like, I'd be glad to have her things all packed up for you. Even ship them if you want. That's very kind of you. Oh, I swear the older I get, the steeper these stairs are. Oh. Well, let me see now. Yes, this is it. 201. I've left everything just as it was. Made the bed and straightened up the kitchen is all. Thank you, Mrs. Halter. If you don't mind, I'd kind of like to be alone for a little while. Well, of course you would. Here, Doctor, you take this key, and then you can come and go as you please. You remember now, I'll be glad to do what I can, like my own daughter she was. Thank you. Th thank you very much. I, I may call on you. Uh, thank you. It looked pretty much like it had always looked full of little things that people use to try to make an apartment feel like home. Knick-knack shelves, doilies pinned on furniture, lace curtains trying to hide the roller shades. And photographs. So many photographs. 
the aftershots that grateful patients send to favorite nurses. He remembered the time he jokingly slipped a picture of Greta Garbo in among those aftershots. Marie had never noticed it. The picture was still there, and the phonograph. What memories there were in that old phonograph. Everybody, quiet, please. Uh, uh, somebody shut that thing off. Thank you. Shut it off, please. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to propose a toast to a man who, up till today, had only one claim to fame, a beautiful sister. My friends, I toast the new physician, Dr. Andrew Richard Johnson, who on this day, through the grace of God, and an easy internship, and perhaps a little cribbing on exams, <laughs> has, has been enrolled in the ranks of the medical profession. May he live a long, fruitful, and medicinal life. And may he... And may he have an anniversary party every year. Here, here. Hey, Jenny. My friend, my friend, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. As I look from your beaming faces to the fruit punch, which my sister started off as a completely harmless beverage, <laughs> I'm brought to the sudden and happy realization that some of you, who are only my dear friends tonight, may be my patients in the morning. So, so I'd like to mention, I'll be on call from 10 to 6, and I'll be doing business in my father's old office at City General. I thank you. <laughs> Good speech, Andy. Right, was it? Say, Doug, you look a little peaked. Let me see your tongue. Oh, cut it out. Have you seen Marie? No. But if you see her, remind her she owes me a dance. Oh, pardon me, miss. Did you call for a doctor? Yes, but I only want one little dance. I'm your man. Say, this is a pretty big party. You must be a very important fellow. Not yet. You see, I've got a good-looking sister. Uh, honey, honey, do you mind if we don't dance? I don't mind. Want to talk? Yes. Come on, we'll go into the kitchen. Hey, hey, you two. I don't think it's exactly sporting of you, Andy, taking the best-looking girl here out of circulation. Now, how about it, Marie? Isn't this our dance? A little later, Doug. I have to fix some more sandwiches. Oh, fine, I'll help. You want to help, is that it? Yeah, and I won't take no for an answer. Well, I'll tell you how you can be really helpful. Okay. You go over there by the piano, and you ask Dr. Murphy's wife to dance with you, mm -hmm. and then you tell her to stop looking for her husband because he had to go out in an emergency call. I was supposed to tell her that, but I forgot. That's how you can help. Oh, yes, but I... We'll have our dance later, Doug. Come on, honey. <laughs> hey, that's not fair. Sit down. Thanks. Frightened, Andy? How'd you know? You look frightened. You shouldn't be, you know. It's a big thing. I, I don't like it. Andy... Can I say anything else? It was different in Dad's day. It was even a different profession. When he started, almost every doctor was a general practitioner with a little knowledge about everything. A man could do as much as he could, and nobody expected anything more. Why are things different now? Oh, there are a lot of reasons. These are the times of great specialization in medicine, and you know why. Because the body's too complicated for one man. I, I used to dream of other doctors coming to me to help them save lives. And others coming to me. You ever have a dream like that? Oh, of course I have had. And so's every nurse and doctor who ever lived. But you're different than the rest of us, Andy. You've got a potential. Someday they will come to you and you'll help them. You've chosen a great profession, one of the highest to which man can aspire, and you're going to make a success of it. But suppose that... Don't suppose anything yet. Just wait and see what happens. The nurse hears things around a hospital the interns don't hear. You're going to be all right. The only thing you need is self-confidence. Just the same, tomorrow morning... Tomorrow morning, my career officially begins, so if you don't mind, in fact, even if you do mind, I'd like to appoint you my guardian angel. If you'd like, Andy. It's like you say. A nurse hears things around a hospital, and the others will know better than I will if I'm doing a good job. Marie, Marie, don't let me be anything but the best. Know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I know what you mean, Andy. I promise you, I'll do my best. I'll do my best. Mm -hmm. 
She had done her best, too. The tattered scrapbook on the end table gave proof of that. The last few pages had been put together with his press clippings exclusively. They weren't very big, only passing recognition of achievements. The scattered small clips in the beginning from the various trade journals of the profession, and then after them, larger mentions. But not so many from the journals as from the society pages of the paper. You, you with the red hair. Oh, hello. You want to walk me to the end of the hall? Just finished with one of my younger patients. I've got to wash off some flu germs. Sure thing. I stopped by your office, thought we might have lunch together if you're not too busy. Oh, I'd like to, but I'm supposed to go to some sort of luncheon over at the Cosmopolitan. Want to come along? <sighs> not unless you can change it to Schroeder's or get me a quick change in a new hairdo within the next ten minutes. Oh, you're just like the rest, expecting miracles. We'll make it later in the week, all right? Whenever you say. Which of your children has the flu? Uh, I think his name is Johnny Leslie, 401. 401? That's right. What about it? Dr. Wallstrom's already seen him. I just delivered the lab reports to him. Do you want to look at that boy again? Look at him again? I just examined him. With a simple case of influenza, he certainly doesn't need two doctors. Why do you think I should see him again? The lab tests were for smallpox. They came back positive. <laughs> Yes, the boy had smallpox. And thanks to the very capable Dr. Wallstrom, he's fully recovered. It had been quite a blow to Andy. That incident had almost stopped him right in the middle of his social climbing. Almost, but not quite. There was a picture with the last entry in Marie's scrapbook. It was captioned, Miss Alice Everett Downey, escorted by Dr. Andrew Richard Johnson, attends the opening of the opera season at Central City. A story accompanied the picture. Doctor, there's a young lady out here to see you. What does she look like? She looks like I'd like to look. <laughs> if she's that good, Martha, send her in. Oh, oh, Marie. Do you go through that routine with everybody? Only with relatives and friends. As a matter of fact, I was expecting someone else. Uh, come on in and sit down. I'll be with you in a second. Where have you been keeping yourself? Oh, I've been here. You've just been too busy. Have you seen this newspaper clipping? Article in the Post? Yeah, I've seen it. Andy, what's happening to you? This isn't like you. What are you trying to say? Once... Once you asked me to help you to be the best possible doctor. Do you remember? I remember. Well, everybody at the hospital knows that this girl's father, Alice Everett Downey's father, is City General's chief benefactor. He's also the head of the board of directors, so what does that mean? Don't you see? You think this is only a political gesture? Well, that's what they're all saying. And you believe it? You couldn't be seriously interested in a woman who's been married three times. Please, don't say you are. We're not that kind of a family. Oh, we're not. Are we? I... I don't know... I don't know what to say. Come on, let's hear all the gossip. Let's hear what you and the rest of the world thinks about me. Oh, Andy, Andy... You think maybe I'm afraid to make the decisions I'm called on to make? Well, you're right. You think I'm afraid to make a diagnosis because I might make a mistake that would cost a man his life? Well, you're right about that, too. I'll never be the doctor Dad was because I just don't like dealing in human lives. Yes, I'll admit I want the assistant directorship. I want it very much because hospital administration is the only phase of medicine I'm fit for. I'm the desk doctor, the guy who thinks for the hospital. I'll be happy to do all my operating on a scratch pad, and the sooner the better. Andy, we... But let me tell you this, I'm not using anybody to get what I want, not Alice or anyone else. Do you understand me? I understand. Don't worry, Andy. I won't interfere anymore. <laughs> Marie, Marie, wait for me. Doug. Uh, hi. May I eat with you? I love it. Oh. Well, let's take this table here. Oh, it's a shame you can't pay my check. Do you mind if we take the corner table? Oh, not at all. <laughs> That's the beauty of these cafeterias. You pay for the food when you get it. <laughs> here, I'll help you set your tray down. Fine, thanks. Uh, you, your hands are trembling. You're feeling all right? Fine, thank you. Just a little tired, that's all. I'm glad you still care. Still care? Well, how about breakfast tomorrow morning? All right. 
That's a strange kind of date. Best I can offer. They got me riding ambulances now, all night long. A full-fledged doctor in an ambulance? Mm -hmm. Scandalous, I know, but somebody's got to do it. And so many of our people are sick. This new virus thing. You know, Marie, we've got the makings of, of a fine epidemic here in our mm, town. I'm afraid you're right. I've been working late every night for a week. Hot, sticky weather, general low resistance, thanks to this virus thing. Twelve new cases in the past two weeks. Yes, sir, the makings of a, a fine epidemic. It could be a bad summer. Uh, are you sure you're feeling all right, Marie? <laughs> Just tired, but if you don't stop me... <laughs> all right, all right. We'll talk about something else. How's Andy? Why, I don't know. You don't know? I haven't seen him for about two weeks. Oh, Marie, wh what's happened to him? What's, what's changing him? Oh, a combination of things, Doug. Old Downey's daughter? That. But there's something else. He says he's afraid. Afraid? Of making mistakes that might cost lives. Oh, that old bugaboo. Oh, he's a naval doctor. But with so little self-confidence. I've done all I can. Yeah, which I suppose is about all anyone can do. Oh, poor old Andy. Ambitious but uncertain, so he pours all his education and talent down the drain of hospital politics. Oh, don't say that, Doug. He'll come out all right. I know he will. He, he's just confused. I, I'm going to have a talk with him. Oh, Doug, No, I... no, I, I am. I'm going to tell him about this conversation. Maybe I can talk some sense into him. It's the least I can do for an old friend. Now? Well, if I don't do it on my lunch hour, I won't have time for it. Good luck. Mm. Oh, say, about our date, I'll check with you later. Uh, where can I find you? Ward 3A. A contagion ward? Don't look so worried, Doug. If you worry so much about well people, you must frighten your patients almost to death. You go talk to Andy. Maria, I, I wish you'd take the rest of the day off. Go home and, and sleep. Oh, but there's so much to do. Please. <sighs> well, if it'll make you feel better, I will. Oh, good. I'll uh, see you at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, then, huh? I'll be waiting for you. I'm sorry, Dr. Field, but Dr. Johnson is out. Uh, out? Well, when will he be back? It's hard to say. He left for Sun Valley early this morning. Sun Valley? But doesn't he work here anymore? Well, he went with Miss Downey. They flew down to spend the weekend with Mr. Downey. Oh, that's just fine. Look, would you set up an appointment call for me for, uh, say, 4 o'clock? That'll give him time to get there. Make it collect. Collect? Yes, collect. And you'd better place it that way now. I'm mad. I don't want to change my mind. <laughs> Doug hadn't changed his mind. He talked to Andy, and Andy made the kind of mistake he'd always dreaded most, a wrong decision. He decided to stay out his weekend, the weekend the epidemic started in our town. Mighty lucky accident finding her the way you did, Dr. Field. Well, we had a date for breakfast. When she didn't come out, I went in to see what was wrong. Well, it might be too late at that. She's been pushing herself too hard. Pulse, weak and fast. Uh -huh. I ordered oxygen brought up. Good, good. Andy? Uh, he'll be here any time, little one. I'm sorry about our date, Doug. Uh, you lie nice and quiet. You'll have plenty of time for dates. Uh, sure. We'll make it up later. Doug, you'll send Andy in as soon as he gets here, won't you? Oh, I will. You mustn't worry about him, Miss Johnson. You're a nurse, and you know you have to rest if you want to get well now, don't you? He'll be here soon. He's probably out on a call. Out on a call. That, that's right. And you know it might take a long time, so try and rest a little, huh? Uh, Dr. Field. Mm -hmm. Doug! Oh, I... I'm not going anywhere. We'll be just outside the door, and the nurse is here. And Marie, you... Uh, Try to rest a little. Come. What's the matter with that brother of hers? He's on his way from Sun Valley. If he'd only come back when I asked him to. Sun Valley? Did he know she was sick? Mm. No, I... I wasn't sure she was myself. I just told him he was needed, and I guess I lost my temper. 
young epidemic on our hands. What was he doing in Sun Valley? Well, he was with the hospital's chief benefactor. Politics. Well, all we can do is wait. I don't think she'll sleep until she sees him. She didn't know he was going? Well, he left her a note at the hospital, but I sent her home early. And so I... she didn't get it. Mm -hmm. Well, waiting is all we can do. Just wait. Where is she, Doug? I came as fast as I could. Yeah, I know. Uh, quiet, Johnson. Uh, you'd better go right in. And Marie, your brother is here. Andy? Right here, little sister. You're not mad at me anymore? Oh, I'm not mad at you. I, I, I didn't mean to hurt you. M Marie, please believe me. Hold my hand? Of course. Marie, maybe if I'd been here where I belong, maybe... Maybe I could have seen this coming and, and you wouldn't have... It'll be all right, Andy. Don't worry about me. We'll both be all right. I should have listened to you, baby. I, I got off on a tangent, lost my way somewhere along the line, but we'll fix that just as soon as we get you well. Don't worry about it, Andy. You're good. Every bit as good as Dad was. A nurse hears things around a hospital that interns don't hear. She's in delirium. You're going to be all right. The only thing you need is self-confidence. Just the same. Will, will you go on being my guardian angel? If you like, Candy. And Marie. Marie, don't ever let me be anything but the best. You know what I mean? I know what you mean, Andy. I promise you... I'll do my best. I'll do my best. You'll be the fine... Marie? Marie? She's asleep. Yes. She's asleep. I'm going to miss that redhead nurse. Yes? Dr. Johnson, are you all right? Uh, yes, Mrs. Halter. The hospital just called for you. The hospital? They seem quite upset. Seems you're overdue for some affair or something. Oh, yes, I'd forgotten. Uh, thank you. I told them you'd be right over. I, I hope that was all right. It was. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce another man to be honored today. A young man we've been fortunate enough to have in our midst since the beginning of his career. I'm sure this will be quite a surprise to him. Ladies and gentlemen, the new assistant director of City General Hospital, the youngest man ever to hold the post, Dr. Andrew Richard Johnson. Uh, Mr. Brogan, Mr. Brogan, members of the board, doctors, ladies and gentlemen, this is really no surprise at all. In fact, I've even had time to prepare a speech, and here it is. <laughs> but if you don't mind, I'm not going to read it. I've worked for this job for a long time, but now I... I just can't accept it. Oh, it's a very worthy position, but it's not for me. You see, I made a promise to someone that I'd try all of my life to be a good doctor. I've got to keep that promise. As assistant director of City General Hospital, I'd be an executive and try to save money for the taxpayers and the benefactors, but the promise was that I'd try to save lives. I thank you for this honor, though. From the bottom of my heart, I... Thank you. A good speech, Andy. Then just for an instant, Andrew Johnson thought he saw someone he knew far back in the crowd. So far back, he only saw the top of her, a spot of red, and then she was gone. 
That's really not so strange, though. A newsboy and a streetcar conductor both had the same experience that afternoon. But they, too, were far away. The conductor, a Mr. Meehan, smiled to himself and thought how nice it was. She really hadn't moved away at all. This is Anne Blythe again. Just for a moment, I'd like to talk about a promise made to all of us. It's a promise made by God when he said, My grace is sufficient to thee. It means simply this. No difficulty can arise in our lives which can destroy us. No problem can become too big when we have the grace or the help of our eternal Father. It's true, but there is a string attached. You've got to ask for help. You've got to exercise your will and acknowledge your need for divine aid. Then you will get it. Oh, it's true, too, that God doesn't just step in and solve all problems for us, but he did promise that he would give us the help we need to solve our own problems. It's a comforting thought, you know. My grace is sufficient to thee. And it's actually the only reason Family Theater is on the air, to remind people to ask for God's help, to remind people of the great wealth of divine assistance available to those who will ask through man's way of talking to God. Prayer. Family Theater urges you to pray. And when you pray, pray together as a family and you'll be assuring yourself of keeping family problems at a minimum. For the family that prays together, stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you transcribed The Redhead, starring Raymond Burr. Anne Blythe was your hostess. Others in the cast were Joyce McCluskey, Herb Ellis, John Larch, Martha Wentworth, and Leo Curley. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by Robert Hugo Sullivan, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program by the Mutual Network, which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us next week when family theater will present You Remind Me of Me, starring Chuck Connors and Charles Bronson. Deborah Carr will be your hostess. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America.